Hello, I'm Michael Bott. And I'm Rupert Soskin. Welcome to the latest Prehistory Guys interview with people who are making a difference in the world of archaeology. Yes, and we're delighted to be joined today by Dr. Seren Griffiths of Manchester Metropolitan University. And amongst the many things we want to talk to Seren about, she has been a director of excavations at one of our favourite places, Bring Kethley V on Anglesey. We met Seren in 2019 at the Prehistoric Society's Landscapes of the Dead conference at the Society of Antiquaries in London, where she gave a fantastic talk. In fact, the first thing I said to Michael after, <laughs> after her presentation was, I really wish she had been one of my lecturers. And it really is no surprise that Seren was the youngest person ever to be invited to give the very prestigious Golson Lecture at Australia National University in Canberra in 2018. Yeah, Seren's work on the Mesolithic Neolithic transition is something we're particularly interested in as well. But just to give you a little of Seren's CV. Dr Griffiths is a prehistorian specialising in the application of archaeological science techniques to aspects of European prehistory, notably scientific dating, stable isotopes, environmental archaeology, 3D modelling and geophysics. Her research includes a critical engagement with the history of archaeological thought and she has active research projects in Mesolithic, Neolithic and Bronze Age Hungary, Romania, Germany and Ireland. She directs two archaeology fieldwork projects in the UK, a public archaeology project in the multi-period landscape around Brinkethley V and a prehistory landscape project in Northumberland. Her PhD was on Bayesian chronological modelling of the Mesolithic Neolithic transition in Britain. Well Sh done. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we get her in there? I think we should. So, Dr. Seren Griffiths, welcome. Welcome to the Prehistory Guys podcast. And thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to, uh, to join us and talk to yes, us. Yes, we have been looking forward to this. <laughs> thank you very much for having us. That's all right. <laughs> now, as ever, you know, the question mark is uh, where to begin and um, the beginning is the answer that comes up. So, Always the beginning, yes. Yeah. Go on, Seren. What was it that first brought you into archaeology? Mm. A minor act of preteen rebellion. Um, <laughs> my my dad, bless his socks. Um, I was about seven, and I said, "Dad, I like history, biology, art, and geography. What can I do?" And he foolishly said, um, "You should be an archaeologist." And then, uh, when I was choosing, uh, after I'd finished my A levels, no, after I'd finished my GCSEs. I uh, duly got myself on an archaeological dig as a volunteer and then uh, went to university. And um, when my dad found out that I was planning to study archaeology, he said, I'm not expletive playing for you to study that. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it was all rebellion. Obviously, the idea of somebody telling you that you can't do something is then uh, um, uh, grist to the mill. But, um, you know, I remember the first time um, that uh, I had my first sort of archaeological thought about criti example of critical thinking. And we were at yeah. Kyle Went Roman Fort in South Wales and I was standing on the preserved um, uh, um, defences around the fort and looked across the flats surrounding it um, uh, as, a, as a sort of 13-year-old and thought, I wonder where the tree line was. I wonder oh, how goodness. far the people in the fort could see and whether they could see people who were potentially coming to attack them. And so that kind of questioning of yeah. what the past might have been like was yeah. is the reason why I'm an archaeologist, you know. Yeah. I wonder what it would have been like. And I think that's um, quite pertinent for lots of people who uh, become yeah. archaeologists, mm. that yeah. question. Yeah. Yes, and what uh, would have segued your you into prehistory and to you know the areas that you have found yourself in? Um, I was quite interested um, for uh, as a as a um, undergraduate in archaeological science, and uh, one of my specialisms is in scientific dating, and I was interested in that because. By having a sequence or a better understanding of the sequence, you can start to tell the stories. And this is yeah. a way of making a really positive contribution 
Um, and so then I uh, got funding to do my master's. I was going to be an Iron Age sub-Saharan um, specialist, but uh, the uh, samples that I wanted to analyse for my master's didn't have any collagen in them. So I had to segue <laughs> quite quickly from Iron Age South, uh, sub-Saharan African archaeology into uh, British Neolithic archaeology because uh, uh, there were okay. some samples at the lab that I was doing my master's in uh, that needed analysing and I needed a very speedy backup project. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I turned left at Iron Age sub-Saharan Africa and ended up in in, um, Neolithic Kent, as you do, and the rest is history. Um, yeah, so, right. Yeah. So, what right. was the ending up in Neolithic Kent? Um, would, was that why you found yourself uh, on the interface between the Mesolithic and the ne and Neolithic in some of yeah, your studies? So, yeah. yeah, so my master's project was on um, uh, radiocarbon dating. A, uh, uh, unusual uh, Neolithic monument called uh, Coldrum, which is um, on the Medway Valley. And um, as a result of that, I then went off and did um, professional commercial practice. And then I did my PhD in more um, scientific dating of the Neolithic. Yeah, yeah. But it's it. So that's and that the period that I was working on was uh, the British Mesolithic and Neolithic, as we traditionally call these. Uh, time periods, uh, so sort of fifth, fourth millennium uh, before the Common Era, um, and uh, your 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 question at the start of this was about going back to the beginning, and yeah. in lots of ways, the late Mesolithic and Neolithic is when British prehistory um, becomes much more um, populated with evidence. There's much more data out there to talk yeah. about. So in some ways, um, look, archaeologists regard that uh, as, you know, the start. You could make a pitch for lots of other things like the first symbolic uh, uh, evidence of thinking in, um, in the Paleolithic and, you know, the start of the Holocene and all of these kind of things. Yeah. But it is one of these um, gear changes, shifts in the material culture record, the number of sites um in that um late fourth early third millennium um period <clears throat> yeah yeah i i did want to ask you before we get uh, uh more deeply into that you have a lot of your work is uh, uh uh, collaborative, isn't it? You've you've got uh, fingers uh, you know, across <laughs> Europe and uh, <laughs> and the United States and Australia. It's like you know, what do you do in your spare time? Um, <laughs> but uh, do, do you want to uh, tell our listeners a little bit about you know your involvement so far and wide? It's uh, an extraordinary amount of work that you cover. Yeah, well, um, yes, but I think archaeology is in lots of ways of vocation uh, especially if you're uh, lucky enough to have a job in academia then you've really been lucky enough to make your uh, passionate interests your your um, way of subsisting so it's um yeah. it's it's you know i'm very privileged in that sense and there's loads of stuff that i want to know so yeah. um i <laughs> end up um, involved in lots of different collaborations with lots of different people and uh, so that includes a whole range of different things like uh, the scientific dating like environmental reconstruction um, uh, uh, like climate change like uh, public archaeology and how we engage members of the public uh, with our research findings and democratize and open up those findings um, like the history of archaeological thought, how a discipline comes to be in the place that it is. And so I do have quite a lot of collaborations um, and uh, they cover quite a lot of different research themes. Like I think I'm quite unusual as somebody who might define themselves as an archaeological scientist to be very interested in public archaeology. That's quite an atypical uh, fit yeah. together. And um, so uh, in some ways that does me not any favours in terms of applying for jobs <laughs> or funding because I <laughs> don't fit nicely into a little box. You know, I'm not just somebody who does um, a particular specialism. I kind of have lots of interests in lots of different things. So I'm not sure that that's always particularly helpful as mm -hmm. part of a career. But I think that in order to keep 
one's research active and interested and engaged. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have to sort of find and develop new research interests. And maybe um, it's quite nice to sort of go back to things like some of the research I've been doing, um, you know, it's um, now 10 years, I think, since I finished my PhD. No, it's eight years. Or, anyway, um, <laughs> you know, you can come back to these ideas and themes and, and sort of... Um, uh, play with them uh, a bit more creatively um, mm. so that's why I've got this wide range of um, interest and um, uh, go, you know going back to the disservice thing um, a colleague said you know which period do you specialize in and I said well you know, I'm interested in lots of things um, you know I, I, I refuse that categorization to a certain extent and I, again I think people uh um, uh, sometimes that makes other academics uncomfortable. But um, part of the reason mm -hmm. why I'm especially interested in scientific dating as a method is that it allows you to work across this really broad geographical and temporal scope right back from, uh, you know, the, uh, yeah. well, I've worked on uh, Mesolithic and, you know, sort yeah. of, um, sites with uh, 9,000 uh before the common era right up to my history of archaeological thought goes into the second world war and yeah, i like yeah, that sure. really broad sweep because um you know it's it's fundamentally archaeology is fundamentally a story of yeah. humankind and our human existence across well, this well wide it strikes range. me that's that you know that's what makes it interesting yeah, uh, yeah, it strikes me that you know, your strong suit is um, uh, communicating the philosophy of archaeology, or you know, and even uh, examining the philosophy of archaeology uh, itself. You know, the the perspective from uh, from dating and timelines, etc. I mean, we want to um, come come back to to this, you know, the the dating, and we'd like to talk about. You know, a mm -hmm. site that's particular to us, that we particularly love and have had association with, <laughs> albeit slightly notoriously, uh, of uh, Brinkethley the. Um, so I don't know if there was a, a question in that or not about uh, the philosophy of, uh, of archaeology and how you feel about uh, you know your relationship to it. Um, I think that. Archaeology can be transformative to lots of people. But yeah. aside from whether we can establish any um, new evidence lines or interpretations that might have a closer semblance to what happened in the past, mm. beyond all of that, lots of people in the present really value archaeology yeah. and archaeological approaches to the world and so it's almost a kind of way of being without getting too uh, deeply yeah. into it you know when we work on sites and we have a volunteer archaeologists coming and working with us they quite often find it to be an incredibly transformative experience um, because of a whole bunch of reasons and people's personal situations and whatever, but and working outdoors and working as part of a team and all of this yeah, stuff. Yeah. But I think one of the most um, you know interesting and this particularly pertinent perhaps at the moment is that um, archaeology, with that very long uh, timeline and approach, demonstrates um, you know. Uh, resilience of the human spirit and continuity of um, uh, human existence and human creativity and uh, enduring qualities um, in us as a species that are really exceptional. And so for people to have, people, contemporary people, to have that connection with yeah. people in the past beyond in some cases you know time immemorial beyond your own individual experience or imagining and to have that continuity that contact that relationship with people in the past is quite a um uh transform transformative or a, a moving experience for lots of yeah. different people and yeah. that's not to say that the past was always you know fluffy bunnies and people happily skipping <laughs> around sharing food and all of this oh, kind no. of stuff it's not to um, sweeten the past in the in a, a superficial or um uh, uh kind of um overly sweet way you know sometimes the people in the past were nasty and brutish and life was short and painful but 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 that long-term perspective for lots of people is really important so yeah. um that's kind of the the ethos or why i think people enjoy of um enjoy archaeology 
Okay, yeah. to a high degree. That we'll wasn't come... really an answer to the question that didn't really exist. We will come. It, we, no, will, it's... <laughs> we will come back to that. You know that those thoughts. I think so. But in the meantime, shall we go to Anglesey? Let's go to Anglesey. I think we should. <laughs> I, I, I want to before we actually get into that. What? Uh, well, no, getting into that. What yeah. was it that actually took you to bring Kathleen the in the first place? Um, well, I'd been doing a postdoctoral research project at Manchester Metropolitan University, which was uh, crowdsourcing um, images, digital images, of oh, prehistoric yeah. monuments on Anglesey and in Gwynedd. And so this was kind of public archaeology meets uh, digital technologies. Um, mm. And there was a big team uh, working on that project. And um, we were doing an open day for CADU, the Welsh Heritage Agency, um, uh, around Brinkethly V. So we were presenting some of the results from that research project. And um, a friend of mine who, with whom I did my PhD at Cardiff, uh, Dr. Fionn Reynolds, works for CADU. And we were uh, standing on top of a rock outcrop looking at Brinkethly V. And um, I think I said, um, you know, this is an amazing prehistoric landscape. There's so much going on here. We've just touched the surface and we know this and this and this and nobody's yeah. doing anything. And why isn't anybody doing any active research on this site? And we sort of looked literally around <laughs> and then went oh okay well, we should do that that's that's yeah. our you know if we recognize that's it wonderful. we're here yeah, really we are the our people. problem isn't it so yeah, yeah 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 so then we've spent um so there's a team of us uh there's dr ben edwards who's at manchester metropolitan university um uh adam stanford who's i uh, at sumo um uh uh an agency that do geophysics and 3D modeling, mm -hmm. and Fionn Reynolds and John Boothroyd, who works for Oxford Archaeology, and we've been working there for five years, I think. And we are in the midst of writing up the book um, about our research findings um, in that landscape. We're looking forward so, to that. So looking it was forward a, to that. Yes, so are we. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it'll be a really good, and it is. It will be really good, honestly, um, it, because it is such an underexplored landscape uh, around yeah, Brinkley, yeah. and it's such an important prehistoric landscape. You know, I um, if I'm doing interviews with uh, uh, media people, I often find myself saying in a really crass, pat way, oh, it's the Stonehenge of Wales. But in lots of ways it <laughs> is, because it's humongously important um yeah. it's it's got this deep time depth multi-period activity it's got complex networks of connections um across mm. the irish sea to county meath in ireland and up to orkney and down to yeah. uh the passage tomb uh monuments um in uh, uh the channel islands and the north of france and uh, uh Brittany and all mm. of this kind of thing so it is a really important monument sorry for well, for Michael's listeners that may not have been <laughs> to Brinkethley, they may not have been to Anglesey. What is Brinkethley V? In you know, so Brinkethley V is a late Neolithic uh, passage tomb, and archaeologists are very good at nomenclature, and they call it a passage tomb because spoiler there is a big passage running into <laughs> the centre of the mound. And in the middle of this, so the passageway opens up into a polygonal chamber and this is covered by an earthen mount. Um, and that's how the monument exists um, uh, yeah. today. Yeah. It's a heavily re restored monument. It was excavated in the 1920s by the Ministry for Works. And mm -hmm. so we have a slightly... Um, Diminished, should we say? Diminished, um, <laughs> esoteric uh, rendering of a passage tomb. Um, yeah. And and that's the way that it's presented. This yeah. kind of um, mound and passage uh, scenario, however, um, 
simplify an incredibly complicated monument and our research has demonstrated mm. uh, um, over a thousand years of ceremonial activity in that landscape and other monuments in that landscape uh, mm. uh, so it's a multi-period multi-phase as archaeologists would say landscape with lots of different yeah. things going on right from the mesolithic up until the uh, bronze age and there's iron age activity in the hinterland around that area um it's a passage tomb, which is a type of monument that's quite common in Ireland or in County Meath and County Sligo. So in County Meath, there's the famous Newgrange complex, which has a whole series of different monuments. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, there are other sites like famously on Orkney, like Maze Howe. Um, yeah. The passage at Brinketley has a solar alignment. So on the summer solstice, on the longest day of the year, the sun rises and gently filters down the passage to illuminate uh, the chamber yeah. at the back. And so this yeah. is an amazing um, uh, solar um, uh, alignment and it's uh, very interesting um, uh to observe it either inside the uh, chamber, if you're lucky enough to be in there on the summer solstice, or um, outside the chamber, so lots of people still go there to witness this amazing um, alignment. Uh, so that's one aspect of the monument that makes it really significant and important, yeah. because these are quite so rare in Britain. From yeah. a few words uh, spoken with Fionn standing on a rocky out. Crop, uh, uh, looking at it, um, there's how many years, uh, how many seasons have you done there now? I think it's five. I'm not. I think it's wow. five. Yeah, that sounds about yeah. right. Let's go with that. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and what are the surprises? What are the revelations that have uh, come out of those those five seasons for you? Um, I mean, you well, know, what we've out? we've identified we've identified. Um, a whole host of um, and recorded a whole host of uh, rock arts, other rock art along outcrops in the vicinity. Some of it was known, oh. some of it had oh. been identified um, in 2005 by George Nash. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a um, um, archaeologist who did an MA um, at Bangor University uh, who had identified a couple of other outcrops along the um around Brinketley but we've got up to I think 12 now of these outcrops with cut marks so little circular pecked depressions into the uh outcropping underlying geology and these are quite unusual on Anglesey um, they're not the most spectacular rock art in the world um but they are anthropogenic humanly modified um yes. features in the landscape and so we've got 12 of those and the placement in the landscape and the number of these sites is really quite uh, unusual and um, unexpected. So we've got that. And then mm. we've got a whole series of uh, other sites, uh, monuments with in, in, in close proximity to Brinketley. So we've got Brinketley Bach, which is a... Um, Bronze Age predominantly uh, 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 round mound to yeah. the south of Brinketley. We've probably got another one of those um, in, in that little complex. So there are uh, at least three uh, round mounds. There might be another yeah. one that's been heavily degraded and ploughed out. And then at the bottom of the ridge um, on which this group of sites sits, uh, we uncovered a grooveware pit circle so a series of five circular pits into which um late neolithic people had put wonderful things so ceremonial offerings including a broken polished stone axe bits of pottery wow. uh yeah. flint lithic stone tools so and this wasn't really the density of occupation the density of monumental ceremonial activity along this ridge really wasn't appreciated until we uh did our work here even though yeah. antiquarian records had suggested that there was lots of prehistoric activity in the last 300 yeah. or so years people had uh you know um robbed these cairns for easy yeah. building material and taken down lots of the standing stones for a whole bunch of reasons um yeah. including uh building materials and things like that so yeah. Amazing. that that density is really impressive. And some of the radiocarbon dates that we've got from the Bronze Age burial mounds and other sites along that little uh, um, uh, ridge demonstrate that, that there's over a thousand years of um, monument building in that particular 
part of the world. So that's kind of from now until, you know, um, Westminster, uh, uh, you know, uh, Norman Abbey kind of thing. So it's a really yeah. long chunk of change in terms of uh, uh, complex ceremonial activity in that particular location. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about uh, uh, your anecdote <coughs> when you, you were telephoned uh, by one of your volunteers about uh, their hands being... <laughs> covered in gold um, yes so the other th interesting thing yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so the other well, <laughs> lots of so we've got this the topography of that ridge on which Brink Ethley V sits and the other monuments sit is really interesting because the places where people have built the monuments augment and delineate the natural shape of the landscape. So you have okay. Neolithic and Bronze Age people picking out this particular ridge and placing their monuments on them so that wherever you approached in that landscape, they would uh, appear more than the sum of their parts. They'd kind of be situated on the highlands and you would come up to them and they would kind of, you know, sort of unveil themselves, for want of a better word. Yeah. And mm -hmm. either side of this little ridge... Um, are currently streams, but in the past, prior to them being canalised, there would have been wetlands. So to get to this ridge, to get to this ceremonial important space, you would have to cross an area of wetland or bog or river channel, depending on the time of year. And so it would be a delineated space, a very different and distinct space from the kind of quotidian day-to-day. -day. You would be aware that you were going into it. It is not, um, you know like going down to the shops it's it's separate and liminal and specific and important and um the uh rock art um ridges are on the other side of the valley separated by this uh from brink Ethley and the other monuments by these wetlands yeah yeah and on one of our seasons and sorry i'm sort of getting ahead of my story um the no, no. rock art <laughs> it's a, a meandering <laughs> story like all good stories the rock art is all um, executed on particular uh, underlying ge geology. So the schists, which have um, within them, they are formed of um, in inclusions including uh, white quartz and red jasper and mica. And we know that Neolithic people really had an interest in quartz. There are deposits within Brinkethley V chamber and famously outside Newgrange there was probably an apron of white quartz and Brinkethley uh, V is constructed out of the, these schists and when the schists are freshly worked they are this wonderful baby blue you know bright uh, uh, vivid colours with mm. uh, the white quartz and the red jasper as well so you would have had this amazing very visually striking polychromatic effect and in a neolithic where uh, your kind of daily experience was six shades of mud you know you don't have synthetic pigments you don't have blue you don't yeah. have these wonderful yeah. vivid colors the monuments yeah. would have looked very um, visually striking and the rock outcrops when they were freshly worked with the cut marks on them would have looked very visually striking as well yeah and there's one specific uh uh, especially big rock outcrop with a whole bunch of cut marks on the top of it, just on the other side of the water course, the river channel mm. from Brinkethley. And one uh, season, I was particularly interested in getting some paleoenvironmental samples to try and reconstruct the landscape. So this is going back to that experience that Kai went when I was 13 or whatever. You know, what did the landscape look like? How visible were these monuments as you were approaching them? Had they cleared the um, land around them to try and make them even more visually impressive and so we were doing a series of test pits and an auger survey uh, between the big rock art, out, art outcrop that's quite difficult to say and bring Kethley V to try and get some paleoenvironmental samples so pollen samples to help us understand the tree cover and all of this and two of our volunteers were doing some auger surveys and doing these test pits looking for paleoenvironmental remains. And as it turned out, we found absolutely nothing. No organics <laughs> at all. Nothing. The whole exercise was, in that sense, entirely devoid of purpose. Um, but what one of uh, uh, the volunteers um, gave me a ring um, on the phone and I was doing a... 
uh, I was leading a tour for a group of members of the public or something. I was doing something else on the other side of the the site. And she phoned me up and she said, Saren, my hands, my hands are gold. And I was like, yep, yep, that's great. Love your work. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Really busy. Very important. Really busy. Can't stop. And she's like, no, 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 they're gold. And I was like, yeah, all right, whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> um, I'll be there. And so I, I eventually um, came over to see her and I was like, oh, my God, your hands are gold. <laughs> and they were kind of glittering, sparkling. Yeah. I always use the analogy if there's um, a James Bond film called Goldfinger and oh, one indeed. of the <laughs> female um incidental disposable females um uh, that populate james bond um um dies by being painted gold and susie's hands looked like this and it was because the uh schists that were on that side of the valley and which bring kathy they are built of include mica which is the mineral that when you yeah. go out on a friday night and you put your glittery eyeshadow on the mica is the thing that makes it glitter yeah. As you do, I'm sure. Um, maybe not at the moment, but um, <laughs> in the in, hopefully soon in the future. Yeah. And so when the my when the blue schist and micro rich schists erode or are worked by people, yeah. the um, byproducts are uh, quartz pebbles, um, which have ceremonial importance, and when you hit them together, glow and produce this luminescent quality, and maybe were used to execute some of the rock art because colleagues working in the Kilmartin era found lots of deposits of quartz around their rock art outcrops so they might even course, have been yes. you know making these rock art um uh, motifs using quartz um so the byproducts of working this stone are the white quartz with its glowing amazing um you know uh animate qualities uh the red jasper pebbles and golden, you know, wonderful golden pigment that if you work it enough will stain your skin, this wonderful gold, vivid, um, yeah. animate quality. Amazing. And um, so that was, it was, it was so visually arresting. And to see that unexpectedly like that on somebody's yeah. skin was amazing. And the, Although we didn't find any organics in that river channel, <clears throat> what we did find was that the, um, and we can't date this because we don't have any, um, uh, uh, either any relative dating from the pollen or any organics to radiocarbonate, um, the river channel had at one stage been, uh, had a very um, uh, clear deposit of this golden broken up mica rich um mm. uh material so at some stage when you were crossing this little stream bed um in the past you would have gone over this wonderful glittering glimmering shimmering yeah. uh, uh, uh golden stream into the um mystical ceremonial island between those wetlands on which brink actually mm. was so you've got a very yeah striking series of material affordances in that landscape some of which were being used to produce rock art and some of which were being used to produce these burial monuments yeah. so i think that's you know that was a really um striking um example of reasons why these places that place might have been chosen specifically to build these monuments so really, yeah, really looking forward amazing. to your book now. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, um, we've done loads. Well, it, hopefully uh, it'll be good. But we've done loads of, um, we've had loads of working with Caddo and Fionn. We've had loads of artists in residence and loads of creative practice as we've been going along. So we've had um, mm. storytellers and puppeteers and yeah. Uh, yeah. performance artists and artists in residence and um so we're going to have the straight book and then we're going to have what we've been calling the art book which will have <laughs> nice. some records of all of these lunatic yeah. creative endeavors so there'll be Fantastic. hopefully there'll be two books um but we shall see oh really looking forward to those were um were you going to be are you going to be going back this season or has that been put on hold <laughs> at the moment um, we we were going to be going back this season um yeah. i don't think we will get there unfortunately um mm. which is a shame but uh i think we'll 
we'll go back uh, next year definitely if we don't get yeah, there yeah. this season. And what stage are you at? What 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 what's the uh, what, what are you expecting to um, bring back from from the next season that you do there? We have a couple of um, objectives that we'd like to have a look at, but I haven't yet talked to the uh, landowner, so <laughs> I, I might not be drawn on those until we've uh, spoken to the Marquis. Um, fair so enough, <laughs> fair enough. Yep. Right. Got any more questions well, about Brinketh with thee, Rupert? I don't think so. I thought it was a good moment yeah. to... I, I, I want to ask you more about your work on yeah. dating. Um, mm -hmm. because you use all manner of techniques, uh, really, to um, uh, to develop uh, ideas here. But one of the things that I was most staggered about uh, in uh, reading uh, some of your work and uh, and hearing you talk as well is the fact that you can get down to sub-century accuracy. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is is staggering. Uh, yeah. and and kind of changes everything really mm. uh, so it, it, from the point of view of giving a chronology to the past you know it, it's enormous so i uh, yeah tell us about that yeah and it's you're right it's a game changer in, in lots of different ways because um you know classically scientific dating can tell us things like you know this site is a bit older than we thought it was based on the material culture based on the pottery and all of this kind of stuff yeah. so there's that sort of tweaking of the sequence but the but the the more for prehistory the more fundamental thing is how we think about narratives in the past and how we write about the past and previously the period that i mostly work on um so the mesolithic or neolithic in britain had been understood in terms of a couple of centuries that was about as quickly as anything could happen because that was yeah. about as quickly as our dating techniques could happen so yeah. as a result mm -hmm. of that you got a whole series of interpretations of the past where it was very very kind of plodding and slow and drawn out and stuff happens but it was almost imperceivably slow um and this uh got kind of incorporated in lots of quite subtle ways so there was lots of discussion about the role of the ancestors and the uh, recognition of the past in the past and all of these kinds of narratives about uh what we might call prehistory and then using uh bayesian statistical modeling to revise radiocarbon dates predominantly uh, hmm. has introduced previously unprecedented precision into uh, these time periods. So as you hmm. mentioned, moving from uh, an early British Neolithic, which was routinely written about uh, in terms of 200 years precision. And we can, as you said, now talk about that in kind of centuries or sub-centuries or even in places you know kind of 25 years and so you actually change the terms of engagement you change yeah. the types of narrative that you can conceive about and the types of narrative that you can write about the past and yeah. in lots of ways archaeologists are kind of struggling to keep up with that radical change in practice because yeah our sort of default causal mechanisms are no longer uh, appropriate. And, mm. um, you know, for example, um, uh, a series of monuments that might have uh, previously been thought about as happening over several hundred years suddenly um, happen in the lifetime of one individual. And that, yes. that changes all kinds of stuff about how you think about that society, yeah. the degree of agency that you might be willing to acknowledge in individuals or how hierarchical that society is or god forbid um sorry this is about to be a bad pun um uh, god forbid that people had religion or some kind of theocratic <laughs> structure that meant that they did things in a particular way um yeah. and and archaeologists especially people who are writing archaeology uh, writing about archaeology in um, periods where there aren't written records, so in what we'd classically call prehistory, are, are very good at, about creating pasts which are quite closely modelled on 
the kinds of society they would like to ha have existed yeah, or, yeah. Um, you know, personal predilections yeah. like that. And, um, and well, what came first for you, Stone? Did you have a suspicion that our way of looking at prehistory may have been a bit skewed, a bit warped? Or was it a revelation that came out of the greater precision that we were able to look, we are able to look at the past uh, with? Um, I think it's constantly, when you get that kind of change in how you can address things, it's constantly surprising. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, not constantly surprising. It's incredibly surprising. Uh, you, you can't, it is it's a complete, um, uh, 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 you know, turns everything on its head. And I think... Um, beyond thinking about that sequence, we, we really now have to start to try and challenge how we write about the past and the kinds mm. of societies that we reproduce because we talk about the Neolithic or the Iron yeah. Age as if yeah. these societies existed and had any intrinsic Neolithicness to them. And of course, that's entirely an archaeological. Um, uh, 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 yeah. approach you know that's our interpretation that's our way of classifying and talking about the mm. past uh, mm. we are currently living through uh, the digital revolution we are all now digital excellent um, you yeah. know we've turned our back on the analogs um, um, and we've moved forward and that's that's entirely um, you know that's not really um, mm. uh, the most sophisticated way of thinking about contemporary yeah. society nor is thinking I about prehistory in these old terms because I, I want a, a listeners to at least get a, a flavor because it's it's not something um obvious in, in the way that it changes its perspective <coughs> uh, on the past and the way we tell stories about particular you know prehistory and the narrative we put to them because uh, i have to confess about falling into the trap because we want a story to tell of thinking it in terms of timelines and uh, cultures because we like grouping things together we like putting yeah. things in compartments uh, and that is the narrative that is fed out there and it's it just trying to prime people that our way of looking things is really going to change very fundamentally over the next years uh, we're going to get um, our appreciation of what people up, were up to is going to get a lot more granular. And that will yep. mean uh, easing away, taking apart the three ages thing yep. uh, and and talking in terms of cultures and civilizations, etc. Pan-European, pan-Britain, all that kind of thing. Um, was there a question in there? Absolutely. I'm not even sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but as, as, as well as that, we have to um, acknowledge that there might be some periods where we don't actually have really very detailed archaeological records. And maybe yeah. the bits where we don't have so much evidence that might be sandwiched between relatively um, rich material culture periods, um, maybe those bits in the middle are telling us something equally um, interesting and that has been under-considered yeah in the in the uh, ways that we think about those bits of past so as well as having detailed uh, kind of sucked in sort of precise bits of uh, of the past that we have a lot of evidence for and might understand relatively well we also have to get our heads around the fact that there might be lacuna in our data set which we're really bad at doing because yeah. you know nobody wants to admit that actually that century <laughs> who knows um <laughs> So there are there are lots of under recognized aspects of this new development in precision that we need to um uh think about a bit more critically. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um how much does uh, the Bayesian approach uh, figure in your work overall? Um quite a lot. So I, I I would say that's my kind of um methodological specialism is looking at scientific yeah. dates and chronologies and trying to um, write up more precise narratives of individual sites or phenomena uh, or bits of material culture, things like mm. that. So that's my kind of method specialism, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rupert and so I... In, in, sorry. 
No, go on, you go on. No, well, I was going to say that, uh, you know, Rupert, no, we, we recorded a podcast a few days ago uh, in which we, it was the dating of pottery uh, in Shoreditch uh, that had come <laughs> up. Yeah. Um, uh, Richard, okay. Ever, Richard Evershed and his new way of extracting lipids from pottery uh -huh. in and of itself yeah, yeah, yeah. without applying Bayesian analysis, etc., seems to be able to narrow dates right, right down. Um, yep. Yeah, and this is a that's a real um, a hugely important um, step as well because obviously a lot of the samples traditionally for radiocarbon dating have been um, organic um, ecofacts, uh, so um, uh, you know bits of charcoal or bits of bone that are associated with a particular event that you want to try and understand. But if you can actually extract the biomolecules from the pottery itself and date the pottery, then that opens up a whole different series of samples um, that uh, and using much smaller sample sizes from those, yeah. those extracted compounds that um, uh, uh, allows you to then use a whole different array of uh, samples as the basis for your chronology. So that's a hugely important development. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Rupert, you were about to ask a question. No, yourself. that's all right. Well, it's, it's, I don't even know if it's an unanswerable question. But um, it, because obviously, you know, as you, as you were saying a few minutes ago, that uh, we have this very kind of clunky problem with um, the way that we've banded history in Mesolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, you know, and on, mm -hmm. that um, – it's enormously misleading that we have this bracket so that you could have something that, say, right at the very beginning of the uh, of the Bronze Age and, uh, and something else that's right at the end of the Neolithic, and they could be really close together. And yet we'll take something that's at the beginning of the Bronze Age and something that's at the end of the Bronze Age, and because of the way we use the terminology, it gives the impression that those two things in the Bronze Age are closer together mm -hmm. than the thing that was at the end of the Neolithic and then mm -hmm. and the thing at the beginning of the Bronze Age. Mm -hmm. So um, in, do you have in your mind a sense of how we can... Because you know, the work that you're doing with, with the uh, Mesolithic-Neolithic transition... Yeah for example, a way that we could more clearly uh, have a flow of time in our minds. You know, how will we be teaching kids in the future uh, of, of this, this timeline, this flow of time, rather than these clunky bands that don't actually mean anything clear at all? Mm. Well, we have to both get more precise narratives and think more creatively about how we write beyond those... Um, quite unhelpful period descriptions uh, that mm. ultimately derive from the three age system. So this um, uh, uh, succession of periods based on the material culture that they use. I think one of the ways that I'm hoping that to make a contribution to this is a big research project that I'm about to start where we're going to attempt to write about 2000 years of British prehistory um, using uh, uh, time rather than uh, period specific nomenclature so we won't be writing about the Bronze Age or the Neolithic we will be writing about the 24th century yeah. BC and hopefully yeah. divisions within that so that gives you a different way around these divisive three age periodizations that tend to split yeah. up and reify chunks of history or time based on very artificial uh, concepts like you know our digital versus analog um, example yeah. earlier so it's uh, if you if you keep those periodizations if you maintain those boundaries to what people in the what you allow people in the past to do in part in your narratives <laughs> um you, yeah. you 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 don't cr allow you don't create the environment where there is dynamism and potentiality in the past you ne never allow people to change because unless there's a point where somebody who is neolithic can become bronze age unless there is that overlap between those material cultures then mm you are creating this segue butting up tele um, um, kind of 
teleological approach to time that reinforces a whole bunch of quite problematic approaches to people and development. And, you know, if you apply that to uh, post-colonial societies, you see that this is, you know, to define um, people by their material culture is, is problematic in the extreme. And, you know, it's the $64,000 question in archaeology. How much can we extrapolate from material culture? And how much does it simply reinforce our own approaches to things and people and ideas about change in the past? So hopefully, to answer your non-question question, question, hopefully by (laughs) using time (laughs) as the structure, but not our more loaded temporal divisions within them we can allow space in our narratives for um for for less reified versions of the past for less uh, for versions of the past that rest less strongly on our implicit biases by using yeah. time as that structure we might might be able to think differently about the past yeah. Might all be a glorious yeah. failure. So in three years' time, don't <laughs> hold me to any of this. Um, we'll see what happens. But yeah. uh, that, yeah, that's yeah. what I—that's what we're trying to do as part of this research project. That makes sound sense. Yeah, brilliant. Well, con- conscious of time marking on, w- marching on. One, one thing I do but, want but, to ask you is what? <laughs> oh, you? Sorry. <laughs> it's um. Yes. Time tell us about your book. <laughs> tell us about your book. Uh, yes. How's, okay, how's right. that going? Um, it's going well, thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> so we are writing up the Bring Kathleen the um, field work book. And stupidly, at the same time, I'm also writing a book about um, scientific dating, um, which has to be done by the end of May, I think. Um, so I've started, I think I've finished-ish four chapters, and I've a bit way through chapter five and there are only 10 chapters in total right. so you know yeah, i've got yeah, a month sounds, so it'll be fine, be fine. <laughs> <laughs> is there a theoretical publication date for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't know after i finished the manuscript um before no i think it's got to be done by the end of the year so that'll be lots of fun um, but yeah, um, scientific yes. dating in archaeology soon to be available from Oxbow Books. Um, mm. well, uh, but it's going to be a must-have book. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it is going <laughs> to. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, yeah. titles just uh, probably don't give it away. But uh, it, it sounds to me like it could probably have quite a profound effect. At least. It'll be shoring up, you know, movements uh, within <laughs> archaeology itself. I mean, and I, is it diff- is it difficult for archaeology? Is it difficult for the culture inside uh, the archaeological world to take on these things? Because some people are going to get a bit hurt <laughs> along the way. Some um, uh, some darlings are going to have to be uh, left behind. Yes. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's quite... Archaeology, like any profession, has its you know own internal politics. So it's quite yeah. interesting um, when you work a lot in chronology and you have to tell somebody maybe that their interpretation, possibly their life's work, um, you know, based on very firm suggestions interpretations of a particular sequence might be more problematic you know might not be quite as robust as they thought um Mm. so trying to prize people's um previous interpretations out of their cold um clenched fists (laughs) can be quite different Uh, i'm sorry professor your magnum opus published last year (laughs) isn't quite right um doesn't win new friends and uh influence Mm. people but yeah i think the most uh, um uh, the best archaeologists are the people who can um engage with new data and 
that challenge their prior beliefs or preconceptions yeah, yeah. or oft published things. And I think when you uh, work with somebody or you talk to somebody and say, actually, mm. you know, that thing, it's mm. not quite what this data suggests. And when they mm. say, my gosh, that's really interesting. Mm. That mm. is the is an indication of an excellent archaeologist in my book. Somebody yeah, who sure. is willing to be entirely proof wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yes, uh, in, excited in, by the truth, not digging their own furrow. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the vein yeah, of so, yeah. sort of uh, tying it up a, a little bit uh, and and finishing up, is these all, everybody's trying to create a story, you know, uh, tie things up so people can understand. In that respect, from, you know, archaeology, from prehistoric archaeology, do you think there's such a thing as a, as a wrong story to come out of it? But we're always going to be creating narratives out of what we've got, uh, and that's always going yeah. to be uh, limited. So everybody's doing the best they can. It's, uh, and so what is the expectation um, of people that are fascinated and interested by prehistoric archaeology, what they can expect as far as a story is concerned. Is it a push-pull? Does the audience, if you like, expect a certain kind of story? And is the story that's mm. going to be coming out in the future is going to be as neat and tidy as was previously may have been the case? Um, possibly not. Possibly not as neat and tidy. Possibly messier, mm. more complicated. But maybe that um, it fits with uh, a, a more nuanced narr series of narratives yeah. about the past. Yeah. You know, again, in contemporary life, you can live in a town and your experience of that urban infrastructure is not going to be the same as other people's. So having that... Um, that messiness, that complexity, that potential for multiple competing narratives rather mm. than the sort of top down, this is how it happened, um, is is perhaps a more honest but more complicated way of thinking about the past mm. that is more mm. in keeping with um, how people in contemporary society feel today. So we, yeah. you know, Jaquetta Hawkes, the awesome archaeologist, is often quoted as saying, "Every age gets the Stonehenge that it deserves," and perhaps <laughs> a more messy, pluralistic yeah. uh, narrative of the past is the kind of narrative that we in contemporary society need to be moving towards. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe so. Thank you so well, much, Saren. Unless there's anything else you we need to. Uh, uh, Query further, no. Rupert. I think that uh, I, I think that's a, a, a great place to uh, mm. um, uh, to wind up. Really, I'm mean, just really very much looking forward to uh, well, both your books uh, <laughs> coming out <laughs> yeah. in due course, yeah. and also um, seriously hope that when uh, when some kind of normality has returned. Uh, to a society at large, yeah. then uh, Mike and I would very much like to come and uh, visit you when you're back up at Brinkethley D. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, we'll almost certainly be doing something around the summer solstice the um, next year uh, in some respect, okay. hopefully. Um, so we'd love to see mm -hmm. you there. That would be great. So thanks once again. Well, thank you yeah, to thank our you listeners so for yeah. uh, no tuning in. <laughs> Uh, and we'll uh, we'll see you all again next time. Yeah. Bye bye everybody. Hello, Michael Bot here. Thank you for watching this Prehistory Guys show. There's loads more to watch, and you can get to some of it on this playlist here. If you'd like to receive updates about when we publish new content, hit the subscribe button. And you can unlock even more content by becoming a Patreon supporter. Hit this button here to find out more about that. See you soon.